here, <laughs> here to talk to us about free trade zones and customs and all that is Michael Solomon. I had a chance to sit at lunch with Michael, a real sharp guy, Diaz Trade Law, attorney at Diaz Trade Law, member of the Florida District of Columbia, New Jersey Bars. He's into tariff classification, determining countries of origin. Uh, he's got all this data available, free trade agreements. He's going to talk about all this stuff. So, Michael, you ready? I'm out of auction jokes. You're on. Test, test, one, two. Okay, perfect. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Solomon. I'm an attorney with DS Trade Law. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, what really DS Trade Law specializes in is counsel on import and export related matters <clears throat> to companies and organizations such as IYBA. This is the agenda for today. Um, it's full of uh, considerations for your clients as an importer of record. And I hope to familiarize you today with the harmonized tariff schedule classification duties, potential Chinese Section 301 duties if your goods are actually uh, made in China. I will talk about the binding ruling process as a tool uh, which you can use for uh, uh, prospective uh, transactions. I will also talk about two duty saving opportunities which actually my colleague uh, Michelle will talk about. One of them is the miscellaneous tariff bill, and then the other one is going to be the foreign trade zone, and I will leave you off with the, ton t with the top 10 importing tips. Okay, so what exactly is the harmonized tariff schedule? Well, it's exactly, the, I mean, that's, that's exactly it. It's harmonized, and it's a tariff schedule. In its physical form, it's literally this thick. It consists of 99 chapters, and it's harmonized across 164 countries and those countries are your World Trade Organization members. Um, so basically, as an example, if you're, if you're going to import a cruise ship into the United States, the classification for it would be 89.01.10.0.0.0. If you were to import the same cruise ship to Italy or Singapore, the harmonized tariff schedule would be applicable to the six digits. So in this case, it would be 89.01.10.0. And this is just a breakdown of what the actual classification code is. It's going to be your first two digits are obviously going to be your chapter number, and then it's going to be your heading, subheading, and statistical suffix. The statistical suffix is very important because of the government. That's the way that the government keeps track of all the imports. And it's very possible that if it sees an influx of some type of imports and a decrease in others, it may raise or decrease the tariffs on those duties of goods. Okay, so now that we have established our classification, we now have to figure out what the actual applicable duty will be. Um, here, uh, we can see that there are two duty columns. There's column one and column two. Uh, column two is kind of your you know, bad boy, bad girl list countries, which are uh, North Korea, Cuba, Russia, and Belarus. And then your most favored nations are gonna be under the general column one duty column. And then if a, a special free trade agreement were to apply, it would be in that middle column. So basically what we're looking at, and this is not a great example, but the next slide will be, is that if you're going to be importing a cruise ship, again, from Italy, the duty rate per this example is going to be free. And then if you were you know, going to import the same cruise ship from North, from North Korea, it would also be free here as well. Um, but like I said, this is not a great example. Okay, so if your vessel or boat is Chinese made, you're looking up to an additional duty on top of the general duty. So in this example, you see that the one and a half percent is the duty rate if you're importing from the most favored nation. You would be subject also to list three of the China tariffs. Now, under President, Trump, <laughs> excuse me, under President Trump's presidency, the US Trade Representative basically initiated an investigation into seeing whether the Chinese government's practices, omissions, and acts were detrimental and discriminatory to the US commerce. And they basically found out that it was, and so it instituted this uh, list of tariff actions, and it came out in four rounds. And basically, that's what they are here. Of course, there are exclusions. However, unfortunately, boats are not a part of those exclusions, so full duty rates apply. 
Okay? So as an example, to look at how if you were to import a sailboat, uh, let's say more than seven and a half meters and then less than 25 meters long, what would be the duty for that? Um, so we can go ahead and just run down the tariff, basically starting off at the top, and I don't know if anybody can see, but I'll just you know, try to make this as brief as possible. But ultimately, we would start off at cruise ships. Obviously, a sailboat is not a cruise ship. We would go down, skip to the next heading, which is going to be fishing vessels. So that's not applicable. We're going to go to yachts. Okay, yes. Are, is, is it an inflatable yacht? No, it's not. So we're actually going to go skip all the way down to the next uh, subheading, which is going to be your yachts, and then it's going to say sailboats with or without an auxiliary motor of a length not exceeding seven and a half meters. So that's not going to be our boat. So we're going to go ahead and skip down to the next applicable subheading, which is going to be of a length exceeding seven and a half meters, but not exceeding 24 meters. So the pertinent duty rate for that is going to be one and a half percent. Now, this is a perfect example of that bad boy, bad girl country list, because as you can see, if you were to import that sailboat from Korea, Russia, China, uh, Belarus, you would be facing a 30% duty rate, as opposed if you were just to import it from, let's say, Italy or any favored uh, country, it would be 1.5%. Now, if the boat was Chinese made, it would be subject to an additional duty rate, anywhere from 75 to 25%. Kind of the same schematic for powerboats, and that the same duty applies. Okay, if you're not sure if your client, as the importer, is not sure of what the proper classification for the boat is, then he or she can absolutely apply for what's called the Customs Binding Ruling. It's an absolutely free program that allows a person to basically put in writing I want you customs to give me a binding ruling and tell me what the classification is and what the duty rate will be on the prospective transaction. So it's something that you can plan with, with your client for the future on an import. And basically customs will give you a binding ruling saying this is what we believe is the appropriate classification duty for your boat. Um, some considerations on this is that obviously it has to be in writing. You do have to provide as much information as possible to include uh, schematics, drawings, uh, any type of information to tell you know customs that this is what you know type of boat my, my boat is. If you do have privilege or confidential information, you can request customs to not disclose that, um, and you can also request an oral discussion, which is going to allow you to basically have a phone uh, conversation with customs prior to them issuing the ruling. So that way, if you say, I believe that the proposed classification for my boat is you know, so-and-so with a 1% duty rate, and the customer's saying, no, we think it's so-and-so with a 5% duty rate, before they issue that ruling, you have a chance to talk with them and actually have the ability to withdraw that ruling prior to being uh, binding. So that way, um, you're going to have a favorable result for your client. Once that uh, ruling is issued, it's going to be uh, publicly available in what's called CROSS, which is the Customs Ruling Online Search System. And that basically, anybody can go there, and if you're curious what your boat is going to be classified as or any type of good, you're, you, you, know, you, uh, you can just you know, go on there and, and look for it. Um, a couple of examples of binding rulings are here on the screen. On the right side of the screen, you have a binding ruling. It's dated 91, but it's basically for, I believe, a 36-foot uh, yacht. And it was classified with a 1.5% duty rate. And on the right hand of the screen, you have a 7-foot instructional, excuse me, sailboat, which was classified with the exact same uh, duty rate. Um, if you do have a novel issue, a niche issue, so for example, if it's a houseboat and you're not sure, well, is it going to be classified as a house or is it going to be classified as a boat? <laughs> then you may, uh, it's worthwhile looking at cross, and then if you're not sure, you could uh, always, always do a customs binding ruling. If you're interested in finding out more about tariff classification, our firm has published um, an article with uh, Bloomberg Law, and you're more than welcome to read about it by scanning that QR code. Okay. Here's the first duty saving opportunities that I would like to discuss with you. It's called the miscellaneous tariff bill. 
Uh, basically, this is a vehicle which you can use to petition the International Trade Commission to petition Congress to ultimately reduce or eliminate your duty rate. Um, our firm has previously helped IYBA uh, with the previous petition. Um, and so this is a tool that you, uh, you could absolutely use. However, the caveat to it is, is that it, it's, a, it's a lengthy process. As you can see, it's about 300 days uh, worth of just, uh, you know, uh, uh, bureaucratic processes, starting from the actual publication of the notice in the federal uh, registration to people submitting their petitions to having um, an open um, public comment period for the ITC to then put its in a preliminary report, then the Department of Commerce, and then for the ITC to put in its final report to Congress. So, and then the other saving opportunities, which is uh, may seem not as involved, at least bureaucratically, is by utilizing the foreign trade zone, which is a tremendous savings opportunity, which my colleague Michelle will talk about. But just as a brief overview, it's called the foreign trade zone. It's not really foreign. It's considered foreign because it's not a US Customs territory. But it's located geographically within the United States. And this is just a list of all the FTZ grantees um, uh, that are here from Central Florida all the way down to Miami. And just as an example, we'll look at FTZ 25. And you can see at the bottom left side of the screen that there are multiple sites. So it's, 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 it's very easy to use, very accessible. And what it basically allows is to uh, manipulate, process, or manufacture goods without ever entering them. Now, probably the most important consideration that I would like to leave you off with is on an offer of sale. If your client is importing a boat and there's an offer of sale, duties, customs duties, have to be paid prior to that sale happening. So you can't just you know, tell your client, okay, let's find the buyer. They're gonna pay the duties on this boat. No, that's not. <clears throat> uh, the, the importer of record, your client, will, will be responsible for those duties, basically. I will leave you off with the top 10 tips for uh, brand new importers. This is a very handy tool. The reason for this tool is because many importers are not aware of the importing requirements such as using the reasonable care standard by looking at the cross rulings when they import their products. So what this could possibly lead to is you know, customs coming back at you and saying, well, number one, you know, either you know, give us more info on your goods, but then number two, you know, they could uh, very well say, we don't agree with your classification and your duty usage. We're, gonna, we're, we're going to rate advance you. And so uh, basically your client is going to end up paying what CBP uh, uh, considers is, is the appropriate amount. Our firm has a plethora of publications that it puts out on various media uh, platforms. You know, please, you know, feel, uh, uh, feel free to scan this QR code and uh, keep up with us. And uh, I will hand it over now to my colleague, Michelle. Hi. Is this on? Okay. I'm going to start out by saying that public speaking is not my forte, so please bear with me as I give this presentation. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to speak specifically about Foreign Trade Zone 241, which is actually the Foreign Trade Zone grantee for all of the Foreign Trade Zone marinas that I personally work with. So the benefits of a foreign trade zone allow your client to put their boat in the foreign trade zone and offer it for sale without first having paid the duty on it. It also allows you to offer it to all U.S. residents as well as any foreign buyer. There also is no time limitation. 
that a yacht can be in an FTZ. The term is between you and the FTZ Marina, whatever your contract is for. Normally they're one year, it can be extended. Some marinas will do as little as 30 days. It also allows for the temporary withdrawal for a maximum of 120 days, and usually that would be for sea trial, exhibition at a boat show, yard work, or maintenance. Planning ahead is extremely important because as we well know, um, marina space and slips are at a premium during our season. So if you want to go into an FTZ, you want to be able to withdraw an exhibit at a boat show, calling one week or two days before the show is not advisable because you may not find a space anywhere in South Florida, let alone an FTZ slip. There's also a lot that goes into activating an FTZ slip. You have to negotiate your contract with the foreign trade zone. It has to be agreed upon. Once that's done, then I come in and I go ahead and gather all your documents that is necessary for me to present everything to customs. I do your entry into the foreign trade zone. I can withdraw you as well to go to the boat show. We have to activate a slip before you go into it, so that's a process with customs as well. You can't call me on Monday and say I want to go into a slip on Tuesday because it's not going to be possible. Currently we're doing activations um, through teams as opposed to customs physically coming out and inspecting the slip like they used to do, which could take up to two to three days. Now it's a couple of hours. When your vessel permanently departs the slip, we have to deactivate the slip in the same manner that we activated it with customs. So the slip has to be completely empty, signs still up, and then we will deactivate the slip. So limitations in protocol. There are limitations with foreign trade zones just like they are with anything else with customs. So the owner does not have leisurely use of their vessel. They cannot go on board, have lunch, have a party, take guests on board. None of that is possible in a foreign trade zone, which is often dubbed the no fun zone. <laughs> so. The, um, you cannot have a cruising license. If you do have one that has to be turned in when you enter the FTZ, uh, customs will cancel it. The original registry must be held by the FTZ the entirety of the time that you are in their slip. Now, many registries now have QR codes, so there are no originals, but you, they still have to maintain a copy of your registry even if it does have a QR code. A subrogation bond is required by a foreign trade zone. The amount of the bond is usually one times the duty. However, the maximum amount of a bond that I can write for the foreign trade zone is equal to the value of that foreign trade zone's bond, which are mostly $500,000. So I will write a bond for $500,000 if the duty is over that amount. A log book is required to be kept on board the vessel, anyone entering the vessel for any reason, yacht broker, prospective buyer, maintenance, anyone going on board the vessel for any reason must sign in and out on a logbook. Customs can come and inspect that logbook if they so choose. The yacht cannot leave the slip for any reason, not improved um, approved in writing by customs, which is called the CBP Form 216. That allows for a temporary withdrawal from the slip for a specific reason, which again is either a sea trial, exhibition or boat show, or yard and work maintenance. Some people will call and ask for a blanket 216 valid for 120 days. We will not do them. And customs is no longer approving them uh, in my experience as well. That allows a vessel to just roam about for 120 days without um, cause, and Customs is not um, wanting to approve those. The, the one point that um, a lot of people tend to have issue with is that a sale cannot take place in the FTZ itself. The boat must depart the FTZ under Customs supervision, which means I go and I have to issue 
a 1300, a 7512, and an AES in order for, and that has to be approved by customs. They have to manually sign off on it so that the boat can depart the FTZ and they can go foreign, Bimini, wherever they want to go to do their closing. That vessel can then turn around and come back in just like it would for any other closing that you're doing in Bimini. Once they arrive though at that foreign port, they have to send me back proof that they got there because that's the final closure for that FTZ entry and I can then cancel the bond with the surety. And while I also want to talk a little bit about boat show bonds versus foreign trade zone because I get a lot of those questions, why can't I have a boat show bond? Um, and what is the difference between the two? So as we know, a boat show bond is valid only for six months. That's it. No extensions are granted on a boat show bond. And it is only for vessels that are exceeding 79 feet and have been sold by a dealer or manufacturer to a retail consumer. So a dealer cannot get a boat show bond. It has to be sold to an actual purchaser. It allows you to offer your vessel for sale to all interested parties during the boat show only without having paid the duty. You cannot offer for sale outside of a boat show, entertain offers from people that did not already see it at the boat show, which is another reason why it's important to keep a logbook as well at the boat show is who visits your vessel. With a boat show bond, which is different from a foreign trade zone, the owner can be on board the vessel, but the vessel does not have cruising privileges it will have to get a permit to proceed from one port to another. So they want to leave Fort Lauderdale, they get a permit to proceed to go to Palm Beach. When they get to Palm Beach, they have to clear in there as well. When they want to leave Palm Beach, they have to clear back out and vice versa. It just continues on. Once the bond expires, the owner has 15 days to either show proof of export or import, import the boat and pay the duty. There are no exceptions to this requirement, no extensions, no exceptions. The vessel cannot depart on its own. It must be cleared out under customs supervision to close the bond and proof of arrival to a foreign port is also required to finally close the bond and get that bond back from customs so that we can close it out with the surety. A boat show bond is for two times the possible duty on the vessel. So, the value of a vessel will limit its ability to obtain a boat show bond. Most boat show bonds are written for about up to $500,000. After that point, as the boats get more expensive and the duty becomes more, the underwriters want um, a dossier basically on the beneficial owner. They want financials. And as we all know, most vessels ownership exists solely for the ownership of the vessel. A lot of owners don't like to give their personal information out that is going to go to the underwriters and then could potentially um, be obtained by customs as well. So it, it, it's getting harder and harder to write boat show bonds, which I see the trend for uh, the vessels because they're becoming more and more valuable. Take air or, or coral ocean. I would never be able to write a boat show bond for either of those boats. You can only put them in a foreign trade zone if you want to then put them in a boat show or offer them for sale. As previously mentioned with regards to an FTZ, there is no limitation on how long a yacht can sit in an FTZ slip other than your contract with that FTZ marina. If they do not want to renew your contract, then I have to clear you foreign to close you out of that FTZ. Otherwise, you can sit there for years, which sadly some boats do. Um, again, the yacht can be offered to, uh, for sale to anyone, including U.S. residents. And that's it. Short and sweet. Well, <laughs> Did anyone have any questions for myself or Michael? Hang on, Bob. Let me bring the microphone to you. Nobody can hear you without a microphone. Did you mention the presence of crew on board the boat during, in a free trade zone? I did zone? not mention it, but crew is allowed on board a boat while it's in a foreign trade zone as long as it is sufficient to maintain the boat to the insurance company's levels. That's usually the guidance there. Now, does the owner want everybody on board? Sometimes not. Sometimes the entire crew may live on board, but the, in the customs um, guidelines, it states enough crew to maintain the vessel to insurance company levels. 
Michelle, is there any limit on the number of 216s you can get while a boat is in an FTZ? I have not run into that as yet. I do have a number of vessels that do uh, often sea trial, uh, which means they have a lot of potential purchasers. Um, so far, Customs has not put a limit and has even commented on a limit. Michael, you mentioned the, um, about the China Section 301 tariff. The additional duty can vary from about 7 to 25 percent. Is there a way to determine that online, or do you have to go through the binding ruling process to determine it? No, no, uh, you could yeah, easily see that online. If you simply go to the harmonized tariff schedule online and you put in what you uh, think is the relevant classification code, if you hover over it, uh, I can go back to my slide. Yeah, I, I'm getting too old or it's too far away, so I couldn't sure, see yeah. it. Sure, <laughs> yeah. No, no, that's a, I mean, that's a good question. And basically, you can see if you go to the online uh, uh, version, the bottom picture there, it has a superscript. It's highlighted in yellow. If you hover over that, it will give you another HTS code. And if you basically put that HTS code into the Harmonized Tariff Schedule search, it will say, this is, you know, going to be an additional you know, seven and a half or 25% uh, duty amount. And do you know what is the determining of the variance in that? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, what was that? Do you know what is the determining the variance of that rate? Like, why would it apply? Just oh, to sure, it? yeah. So it, it's it's going to be based on which which list that it's, uh, it's, it's on. So basically, as I mentioned, uh, there was basically a four round you know, action, uh, you know, actions of tariffs, and depending on what list that classification code is on, that's going to determine the actual uh, Section th uh, 301 uh, additional duty. And one last quick one, is there any talk from the current administration of getting rid of that uh, tariff? Y yeah, so that's a great question. Actually, the USTR is in its uh, review period, uh, administrative uh, review period, at which it does every four years. So actually, it should make a decision of whether or not it will keep these additional Section 301 duties uh, very soon, uh, maybe by the end of the year, maybe uh, next month. And if you visit our site, you know, you will uh, certainly re uh, uh, you know, uh, read about it, be, be informed about it. Uh, does that answer your question or? Sure. Quick question on uh, the 301 coming in from China, is that on the whole value of the boat or can you separate out like engines that are made from Sweden? Can you separate those out? Uh, that's a good question. So it's based on Chinese made goods. If the actual uh, commercial invoice lists the boat as country of origin China, you're going, you're going to be paying the value that's on the commercial invoice. So that value is going to be used to determine the value of the boat and that's going to determine your general duty. So for example, if it's, a, if it's made in China, you're gonna be paying the general duty rate, you know, if it's like uh, one and a half percent, and then you're also going to be paying the additional section 301 duty. In that regard, as far as parting out parts, there's an explanatory note which basically states that if you import a vessel, although incomplete, you're basically paying the duty for the entire vessel as if, as if it was complete. With what Michelle just stated, it's very useful to utilize the foreign trade zone in order to put together your vessel. So for example, I'm, and I'm not sure about this, but if, if like, let, you know, let's say the hull is made in China and it's only 35% of the actual origin of the yacht and all of the other parts, the 65% make up the, the rest of the yacht, you can you know, try to make a case that the country of origin is not China, but of, of those other parts, if that makes sense. All right, Michael and Michelle, thank you. Michelle, I got bad news and good news. The good news is you did a great job. The bad news is we'll ask you again. So thank you very much.